pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, roll call, Mrs. Mayor. Indeed. Tim Manniker. Here. Gary Dunlap. Here. Tom Cruise. He said he'd be coming. Late. Okay, he'll be coming. All right. Steph Jeff Bell. Young. Here. Freshman, right? Cheryl Hancock. Here. Anita Shagasinski. Here. Myself, I'm here. And Lisa Collins. Here. Okay, well, so with six of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Uh, board norms and reflection. The norms are in your folder. Take a look at them as we proceed through the evening, the meeting this evening. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been published, distributed, and sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes? Okay, seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Discussion? Motion has been made and seconded to approve the agenda as published. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask a five minute time period per person to be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. And I don't see anyone from the public coming forward. So then we will move on to recognition and thank you, Dr. Mueller. Yeah, the school district of Holman would like to publicly thank the es Espleen family for recently donating um, a canopy and a windscre windscreen to be exclusively used for the high school home and soccer team. Um, their generosity is greatly appreciated. So thank you for your support. Hey, thank you. Then moving on to district administrator's report. Dr. Mueller. Yeah, well first I would like to welcome Greg Kruger. He's our new director of it's uh, IT in the district. He's here today, and um, it's his first day on the job. So welcome, we Greg. Can wave and yeah. say hello. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. Yeah. I think do we make it official tonight, or did we, we make did. it? We did we at the did. last meeting. Okay, and good. So he is. He, he showed up, so we're in good hands. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The trick is if he comes back tomorrow. <laughs> oh, okay. No. <laughs> Anyways, so welcome. Um, and then also, we've had very successful registration recently. We had um, record turnout, I think, in actually some of our buildings um, with students and families coming in and registering, so <coughs> we're off to a good start. And tonight, we, uh, right now as we speak, they're having their open house at the high school for the freshmen, freshman orientation. And then Wednesday evening um, is the majority of our open houses are all of our elementary schools and middle school sixth grade will have their open house Wednesday evening some at 4 some at 4 30 it's all on the website and then Thursday evening um, grade 7 and 8 at the middle school starts at 4 30 it's a great time to meet your teachers and get to know the building and get situated so you're they're ready for the start of school um, and then we welcome back we welcomed our new teachers back today and then we welcome back all of our staff on Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. with a breakfast um, and then having our opening ceremony at 8 a.m. So looking forward to my first um, time with that and I'm hoping that um, all of our staff are able to attend and come to that. So that's pretty much it for that. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, and then continuous improvement plan end of the year update, anything on that? Yeah, just um, just so you know, in the Dropbox, um, we currently have some of the um, PDSAs from last school year um, to take a look. And they're to help kind of guide us as we meet as a board and in our work coming up in October. Um, Matthew Fail was here um, the week of the 10th in that and did some work in getting us started on our um, PDSA work for this upcoming school year, which I will be sharing some of that information with you. and where we're at in that. Um, in the PDSAs, we have a lot of data that's embargoed um, this year that has not happened in the past as to why you will not see all of the PDSAs that you're used to seeing in the Dropbox at this time. It will be embargoed until? Uh, some of it probably, late September, yeah, late September, oh. mid-October. So yeah, the Aspire ACT data is included in our badger exam data which is our ELA and math data so okay 
So then moving on to reports and discussion, uh, parent transportation contracts, Beth Hobbs. Hello. Hello. Hey. I have one parent contract that we're starting off the school year with, with a special ed student that the parent transports. So we'll be paying that student, as you see, it's a cost of $6 per trip for a maximum of $21.60. We do base that on their attendance, so we get an attendance every month and then that parent gets paid every month. I also, at the end of the school year, will be bringing my parochial school half-day student because we, we do that on attendance also, so we don't have that cost until we get that at the end of the school year. I think we only had three or four last year, so it's okay. not a big expense right now. So that's okay. all I have. Any questions on that? Okay, nothing then that will be on the next um, agenda for the consent agenda. Yes. So thank, thank you, Beth. Thank you. Then um, notification to parents, guardians of board adopted student academic standards, Wendy Savasky. Oh, good evening. So with the new budget act, uh, act 55, we are required to notify parents and guardians of our academic standards that we use for instruction. So we must have them approved by the board and then we may post them online for parents to see which standards we have adopted as a district. So tonight you will have a consent paper to adopt the Wisconsin standards or the Common Core State standards, the Next Generation Science standards, and the Wisconsin Model Academic Learning Standards. So that's it. Any questions? <clears throat> me several questions on this and in reading this I understand that this is new with the budget and needs to be in effect prior to the start of the school year which is why we are taking action on this tonight. Yes. Um, which obviously setting these academic standards without a lot of prep, without a lot of discussion information is a little concerning to me. I'm blaming the state of Wisconsin for that though, not certainly anyone here. I also notice in reading this though, it says that um, the school board must annually include an item on the agenda of the first school board meeting of the school year after July 1st. Right. This so obviously is not that. Is there an exception or an exemption this year because of the recency of the state budget or how is that so the July 1st is more for us because that's when our academic school year the next one will begin so it's just kind of a notification and a reminder for us that we'll do it earlier next year yeah. they did not actually approve this till July 14th mm -hmm. this year so yes. we had a waiver for this year and so the whole state did the whole mm -hmm. state did so starting next year it will be on our um, in June for review and with approval at our first July meeting. Yeah. And what was the process that these were the measures or the determinants that would be used for the, um, I guess, kind of the, to comply with the, the uh, academic standards? Sure. Um, boy, in 2010, our, our teachers started working with the Common Core State Standards and they rewrote all of their curriculum to match the Wisconsin standards or the Common Core standards from mathematics and English language arts. And currently our science folks are in their curriculum review process and they decided the next generation science standards were a better match for them. And then the others are truly just our Wisconsin model academic standards. And so these either are currently what we're doing yes and are in um, practice it's just that we haven't gone through the step of every year then re reaffirming that yes we want to do the common core standards and those things. right okay and, and then last question because of the late state budget being passed and this being a provision of it is there any provision in that for us to not have that in place at the start of the school year or is this I, I believe it's just an expectation by the state that it is available for parents at the beginning of the school year and I, I certainly understand that it's just you know always cautious about rushing without proper process and study and and you know kind of going away for, for something as important as setting academic standards and being introduced and voted on on the same night um, is obviously, you know, right. always causes me to 
kind of pause and ask some questions. Nope, that is perfectly fine. That's why we're here. But as Dr. Mueller said, these are standards that we've been working on with our teachers for for math and English language arts for the last five years, and our science educators have been working with the Next Generation Science Standards for the last two years, and the Wisconsin Model Academic Standards have been in place, I think, since 2003, so they've been around for quite a while. I'm sorry, I said that was the last question, but I do have no. one more after you're speaking. Do we know what other school districts are doing with respect to this and how closely aligned are we with any of the other school districts? We are aligned with our neighbors. Mm -hmm. Anything else? It, Kate? Yeah, just a question. Tim, when you said you ask a question, and I respect that a lot, um, do we adopt these standards without a lot of prep? But I feel like our district has had tons of prep or I'm misunderstanding your question because we've been working on this for five to six years or mm -hmm. so what do you mean when you say without a lot of prep no, because I'm the certainly public, not saying the district the doesn't have a lot of prep this. yes so but I if, want them to know that we yeah. have prepped right well it depends on how you use the word we and want don't want to get in semantics but as a board member I don't feel I've been prepped for this is the district is the administrator are the people behind the scenes I don't doubt that okay but as a school board so what I haven't was. been very prepped on this and I'm being asked to vote on it and right. I just don't normally like to just rubber stamp things if I'm asked to vote on it okay thank you. that's where I don't feel we as a board have been prepped on All right. this. and I think that's why I was trying to reinforce that these are things that we as a board have already approved we've approved these curriculums we've approved <coughs> the adoption of the common core standards it's just for the every year for public awareness purposes that these are being brought to our attention and being having having to be vote common core standards you know it's a political hot take and I think that's why it's out there but we have as a board looked at this studied it and approved it previously so and, and, and I think to be clear I know it is a political hot potato which is why I wanted to ask some of the questions mm -hmm. and and I in those of, who've been on the board a long time know that I am never a fan of anything being introduced and voted on in right. the same night I agree. and so I'm always very cautious when we're asked to do that uh, good that, questions you know and and in this case are we kind of pushed into this mm -hmm. position because of the state yes I understand that you know were we not I probably wouldn't have even been supporting this tonight whether I did or I didn't just out of principle but right. we're, we're kind of our, our hand is forced here because of the mm -hmm. actions of the state mm -hmm. so and with that any other questions I had a question. Didn't in Governor Walker's budget say we don't have to accept these standards? I thought there was some comment in there. I remember Kristen, Kristen I said something. I, I'm, well, I, I don't know if I, wasn't there something in there that said you could allow I don't think us? we have to adopt these standards, but we have to adopt standards. Oh, okay. And okay. so, okay. Want to. right. Well, you guys, are, I'm not as involved in it, so it's fine. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I do. I have a question. Sure. Um, and I'm not sure how to tie this in teacher effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So, with the Common Core standards, is there any room for flexibility um, with teacher effectiveness to not implement so much of the testing to to evaluate kids as much with the frequency of testing involving the Common Core? Is there a way to so I think you know we always have to look at assessment instruction yeah. go hand in hand and there's different types of assessment there's an end of unit assessment or a benchmark assessment that is kind of autopsy data data to say where are kids at mm -hmm. and the other assessments that we do are more quick on the spot assessments to just guide our instructions so that we don't wait until the very end and say oh my goodness they didn't know it it's so not exactly t a big test every other day per se it's just oh goodness assessments no. just kind of a way of seeing where kids are at yes okay no, thanks no mm -hmm. I um I was just um I read a book about this and I'm still totally learning all this but I understand that these standards were not written by teachers I've read that in books but they were designed by people that never taught in a classroom <laughs> am I wrong with that no you're wrong There's yeah okay. 
this all began with um, educators, really award-winning teachers and administrators, and th those standards were written by people who had been in the field what for standards? a long time. The like Common Core standard. Yes. Yes. And there's a lot of missing. It was even I remember there. when they first came out, Tom. It was like there was a kind of an email out there that was like, "Are you interested in writing about this?" Sure. Sent sure. to teachers. Um, so, if you've got info on that, send that to me. I've got info on this. I'll send it to you, sure. <laughs> and sure. we'll figure this out. But I'm really comfortable in answering the question that yes. These standards were written by the best teachers that the state and this nation has. Yeah, I just don't, uh, I always fear they're just, just piling on something else they have to deal with. So um, that's a very generic. Yeah. Actually, they're better standards than what the Wisconsin model academic standards were. They're more concise and they help educators know really what students need to know. When we had the Wisconsin Ma Model Academic Standards for Math and English Language Arts, they really only told us where kids needed to be in fourth grade, eighth grade, and twelfth grade. Okay. A and educators had to guess where, you know, if you were a third grade teacher, you had to figure out what was your piece of the pie to help kids get to the fourth grade standard so they are more concise and Kate is right about lots of educators being involved and I know when both the Common Core and the next generation science standards they had multiple versions of them and they always sent them to educators to send feedback and they made changes and adjustments based on teacher feedback and that was Correct me if I'm wrong, but as a result of No Child Left Behind legislation, um, the state wanted to opt out of that because at one at this point in time, we would have had to have had 100%, I think, 100% mm -hmm. of our students achieving um, proficient, proficient, right, right. Or proficient <coughs> or advanced. And the state of Wisconsin recognized, as did other states across the country, recognized that that wasn't necessarily um, it, because it was going to be then, um, if you didn't hit those marks, then you were going to be financially Next. hit, yeah. right? Okay. And so they recognized that didn't wasn't necessarily the appropriate motivator to hit those marks. And so the Common Core standards then nationally, which I don't, you know, I am all about local control, but nationally the idea of them was that it doesn't shouldn't matter if your student goes to school in Wisconsin or Delaware or Michigan or Mississippi that they will have the same exposure to the same standards uh, because they're getting federal funding for education and that's kind of where that inter intermingling was and then the other two things that you've mentioned that we're looking at are then the curriculums that we're using to accomplish those standards Right. If you go on our district website, you will see the Common Core through our math and ELA standards, and it is very evident that those are the standards that we use. Just curious, how often are they modified, the standards or the, the pathway to education? I mean, do you change it? Is it a, is it a, a, a moving so, target? I think it kind of should be, but I just was curious. Yeah. You know, in the past, the Wisconsin Model Academic Standards were there for a very, very long time. So, you know, moving to the Common Core was new, but we constantly look at our curriculum, and we use our standards as guideposts to write our curriculum, meaning that the curriculum can go above what the state expectations are if we believe that, that our students are ready for that. So we're constant, and that's with the curriculum cycle and the documents that come before you every year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, just Kate. one comment too, as part of Tom, when we talk about how this all started is that um, the United States is one of the, f was one of the countries in the minority that did not have a common curriculum. And that's kind of where that name came from. And so we also had countries much smaller than our countries that are first world countries that outscored us. And one of the things they studied was they had a common curriculum. So every child, 
every child from a poor district, a rich district, whatever, had a common curriculum. And so that's where some of that came from. Um, and that's why I think a lot of um, educators got on board with this, was to catch us up to some of that. Because when you look at test results between countries, we're not always the best. And we used to pride ourselves <laughs> in being the best. So it was like a movement toward that. So just well, a bit of history there. And correct me if I'm wrong again, <laughs> but I know to Lisa's concern, the establishment of these standards doesn't establish how many assessments we do no. or what assessments we do. That is a different component of um, the, the district. And because we are a data-driven district, we've chosen to do certain assessments. And um, yes. so th this doesn't necessarily mean we're going to do X number of assessments. It's, this is the curriculum delivery in the classroom. Yeah, it's just flexibility. The control of the local, just like you said, is something we never want to lose, mm -hmm. ever. So. Yeah, and and that is why we write our own curriculum documents, you know, that are based on the standards. Is that why you have a different color room too? Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, because I like color. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Any other questions related to the academic standards? Okay, then we will move on to agenda review annual meeting. Dr. Mueller. Yeah, as required, I'm presenting to you tonight the um, agenda for the annual meeting on September 28th, just to get any review or input um, from you this evening as I move forward with preparing for that meeting. So any changes? It follows the same format we have in the past, but... Um, just wanted to have it out there for your review. Okay, then um, elementary staffing. It's okay if I talk to you from here? Yes. Oh, okay. Unless you have a presentation. I sure don't. Um, <laughs> I've been trying to keep you up to date. We've had quite a few families um, entering the district in the last couple of weeks um, to the point where our enrollment numbers, we, had, we were at 77 sections a couple weeks ago um, with having 79 sections last year. We had to fill a kindergarten position at Prairie View, a fourth grade position at Viking, and then we came to, and this is all based off of the board policy, and then we came up, um, at Evergreen, we needed to add a kindergarten teacher, which put us at 80, which is one section above what we had last year. As to um, the timeliness of this, um, I know we like to review before we consent, but to have a teacher in front of the students um, before the school year started as to why I'm bringing this before you this evening um, for a, a consent item also. So, Are there any, any questions? Questions or discussion? Is it true that the high school's almost at 1,200? <laughs> I mean, that's yes. like the high number of, for, that's correct. for, um, what is the word? Maximum Full capacity. capacity, thank you, yeah. And, that. and just so it's on your radar too, um, at, at Prairie View, we are sitting very close in grades one and two where we would be at the threshold where our policy would say we should add another um, staff member. So as we look at this, there might be some decisions down the road we have to make so that we can follow our policy, provide the services for students, and take a look at where we are budgeting um, certain parts of our funding. So we'll stay within our guidelines. Okay, any questions? Okay, then I will move on to budget criteria for funding determined. Mr. Clark. So in your board packet, you um, had two documents. You received the pending funding criteria themselves, as well as an issue paper. Um, as I was reflecting on tonight, I was thinking to myself, um, our public, if you said criteria for funding determination, would probably not know what we were talking about. So I thought I'd put together just a quick PowerPoint. Um, not that the board uh, isn't familiar with this, because this has a little bit of a history, but uh, for our public. Uh, so the topic is the criteria for funding determination. The first question I thought we might review is uh, what are the criteria for funding? Well, criteria for funding 
are a recognized part of our budget development process and the criteria for funding serve as a tool to assist in decision making on things that will receive funding in the budget. I guess I'd say that uh, in my 28 years of business administration, and some of you have been on the board for a while too, would say that you've never experienced a budget where there was more money than there were needs. And so that means you have to have some criteria for sorting things out. Uh, and as a result, um, there are some difficult choices. And the budget uh, choices will always leave us with some un and underfunded items. Uh, this is a way uh, to use some criteria, specific criteria, to determine how money will be spent. And so the next question would be, well, what are the steps for approval of these criteria? If we use them for making these budget deci decisions, how did, we, how did we come up with them? Uh, back in um, November of 2013, we first used a budget development process that included uh, criteria. And then uh, for the 2015-16, remember we went through a second draft of these, and we actually made some changes, tweaking, improvements, because we learned things in our first application of those uh, criteria. So in 15-16 budget development, actually the budget we're in this year, we used a revised set. And uh, we took that revised set to the leadership team uh, recently, uh, August 12th, and sought their input on the budget criteria. And the consensus of that team was, um, this worked pretty good this year. Let's not make the same kind of changes we did last year. Let's keep our minds open to change, but let's run it through the way we did last year at this time. And so we're here before you tonight to give you a review and take your input. And then you'd be asked at the September 7th meeting to approve a final set of criteria. And here are the criteria categories we have. You notice a common theme that they're aligned with the focus areas. If you go to the district's website under continuous improvement, you'll see that the board is approved and the district has six focus areas. And so it's no co small coincidence that if that's what our board tells us we should focus on, why wouldn't we have our budget decision making tool be driven right towards those same results? The one that's not is safety. And um, as we developed the criteria administratively and as the board approved in the, even the first draft, safety was in there. And uh, whether it aligns perfectly with uh, the other focus areas, uh, we felt we needed to have something in there to give that budget consideration. Now, I don't expect everybody who's sitting in the audience or at home to be able to read that, but this is the actual document the board receives. And it lists the criteria down the left-hand side. They match the same ones I just showed on the last PowerPoint. and then. Um, the degree to which any unfunded need is, uh, matches that criteria is actually rated, if you will, evaluated based on how well it meets, to what level it meets that criteria. And so this is a tool then that our district administrator would use uh, to uh, make sure we understood to what degree each budget item met each of the focus areas. That's page two. It just continues with focus area leadership and safety, and then uh, it makes mention of mandates and how we treat mandates in the uh, budget development process. Um, so then the remaining question I had was, well, why do we even bother having these things? Couldn't we develop a budget? Well, you could develop a budget without it. We, we did in the past, but it does afford consistency in decisions. Um, equity, that is the same criteria, are used to rank regardless. Um, alignment of the decisions with our focus areas is important. Transparency in how we make decisions we feel is important. It allows for more timely. So if you didn't have criteria and every time a need came you had to figure out what you were going to evaluate it on, you just wouldn't be able to make decisions quite as quickly. And then finally is credibility. And actually the items listed in the top five there, consistency, equity, alignment, transparency, timeliness, all add to credibility in budget decision making. And so that's why we have the uh, criteria. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Okay. We look forward to any input that you have. Um, we will, as I said, be presenting these again uh, at the September 9th, 9th. I lost track of it. The next board meeting. Okay. The seventh, I think, you had. 
So then moving on, we have budget proposed, um, budget approval, Julie Holman. Can sit down. Okay. I've asked Jay to join me. <laughs> I don't know. Let's just DPI for a minute. Good evening. So in your board packet tonight, you have a revised draft of the proposed 1516 budget in DPI format. And you also have a memo that accompanies the revised. Uh, my apologies for not having this posted last, last week when the budget was put into your Dropbox. We are required to bring a proposed um, budget to the board at this time of year. Um, and I just want to I emphasize that this is a proposed budget. It's a working document and a work in progress. Um, there's much uh, fine tuning to be done before even the consent in two weeks, uh, much less the original budget adoption that the board will approve um, in October. Um, I'm gonna speak from the memo that you have in your packet this evening. Um, we just came off the draft uh, of the financial statements the auditors presented to the Finance Committee before this meeting today. Um, and so um, in the proposed DPI format, you have an unaudited 1415. It's as close as we knew at the time. So that's still being fine-tuned and finalized with the auditors. Um, so that column is close, but it's not um, <coughs> your final product for the end of the 1415 fiscal year. Um, so I'm going to speak to the memo that I've shared with you um, to remind the board that the development of the annual school budget is a process that begins almost a year in advance, um, uh, in advance of the final original budget approval. Um, the board reviewed a preliminary budget, uh, actually before I was even here on site, um, in February, and then um, we're here tonight to look at the draft of the proposed budget um, that'll be on the consent um, next meeting. And then in October, um, the original budget is approved with at the same time as the school-based tax levy for the next year. The 15-16 um, revenue confirmations um, since February are shared on the memo in front of you. Um, we brought some estimates and then we brought back um, discussion with Walker's budget and then in June presented on what we knew at that time. Um, we've confirmed the 150 per pupil categorical. That's approximately 600,000. It is not new money. Um, last year our actual per pupil categorical was $592,350. So it's about in the same ballpark using 4,000 students. Um, obviously, that number can change as our enrollment um, grows or is greater than anticipated. Um, and then the other confirmed number is the 655,000 approved technology referendum for four years. Expenditures that have been added to the proposed budget include the wages and corresponding benefit increases that were approved through uh, salary negotiations. Um, just a reminder to the board, the CPI urban as of um, July 1st was 1.62 percent and that was the percentage used to calculate the base wage schedule increases and then each of the groups may have um, distributed that a little differently so may have um, negotiated just under 1.62 depending on that group's decision and the board's approval. Um, the board has approved an addition of 3.5 teacher FTE, a high school science teacher, high school language arts, um, an early childhood special education and a half-time um, talented and gifted position. Um, the board has approved a seven hour a day educational assistant and then the new position, the SIS or student information support position and then um, additions to the expenditure budget um, in the general fund also is the corresponding technology referendum expenses. So up above the addition of the referendum and, and then in the center of your memo, the addition of the 655 for expenses. Within that 655 was a position approval of the full-time IT help desk and system support position. Some of the outstanding variables include um, 
we never really know the distribution between equalized state aid and levy until the third Friday September pupil count. Um, and so that'll help us um, finalize some of those numbers for the original budget. We do have some outstanding a new position requests. One of them that um, Dr. Mueller just presented was a um, 1.0 teacher for additional section. And then there are some educational assistants um, um, that we need to hire, but since the board had not yet approved them, they're not in the proposed budget. Um, we have outstanding vacancies, and so there's some um, estimates in the budget. We don't necessarily know, you know, if we're hiring a teacher, what they're going to come in at as far as their experience, their step and lane on the schedule, um, or benefit participation, which can um, vary. Um, there's some reconciliation yet to be done, not just with last year's one-time allocations um, to make sure all those items have been removed um, from last year's budget to this year's budget, but there's also many line item items that need further analysis as we um, narrow in on the proposed budget that'll, that'll be on the consent in two weeks. So there's definitely some um, more drilling down that needs to be done within these summary line items so that we that we know for sure that what's being presented um, is accurate and not just forecasted from a prior budget. So work to be done there. And then the final item on your memo is the adjustments for health insurance. If you recall, we added a third plan this year. That third plan premium was at a savings. Um, I have not ha gone through the step-by-step -step process to determine election changes by participant and reduction in district um, employer costs towards those premiums to reconcile prior year to the budget that's being proposed. So again, it is a proposed budget. We do need to bring it to you, but it's a work in progress um, document that will continue to have some fine tuning as we go forward. Questions? Do you have anything to add, Jay? No, fantastic. <laughs> Any questions? Tim? I have several. That's okay. Um, mm -hmm. This that was handed out was revised in a change from what was in the board packet earlier last week. Yes. It looks like it changed by quite a bit. It changed because the um, technology referendum line items were wiped out of the 1516 budget okay. within the software. Okay. Thank you. And the positions that I have identified as um, right in the middle, the 3.5 teacher FTE, the educational assistance, the SIS um, position, those were all, because I had to add the technology piece in, I also added those numbers in as we were working towards the original budget. So they were not in there Friday. It approved, but not keyed into the software, basically. And, and as I kind of look at this and, and just to clarify, the we're looking at a, a deficit of $1.38 million. Currently in the proposed, that is correct. Currently in the proposed budget of, of one million. Right, but there are a lot, remind the board, there are a number of line items that need to be, um, just the detail that are in the summaries need further analysis. We do not anticipate that that'll be a deficit spending. And I also remind the board that in this proposal, the expenditures exceed revenue. It doesn't mean we're deficit spending if we have fund balance, but we certainly want to get closer to revenues equaling expenditures so that we're not drawing down fund balance. The 8.4 million proposed end of year next year fund balance is just under 20%, so just below the lower limit that the board has set for um, the range we want to stay in. And so then knowing from in the past that, that, that fund balance dwindles during the year to sometimes being zero or, or negative given the peaks and flows of revenue versus expenditures, how is that going to impact us? Would that put us into a borrowing situation where we may end up having to borrow because our fund balance would have the cash flow may dip is what you're saying which can happen as you wait for your tax revenues or your state aids to to come in so that's not uncommon um in the no, go ahead in fact yes, 
in recent years, that has happened to mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. um, we've adopted for mm -hmm. some time a strategy of taking those proceeds we've collected for our debt service and actually covering the general sh fund shortfall, returning then with interest the funds. So the idea that we may have to cash flow borrow would not be new. No. We've not gone externally uh, to do that. Right. Uh, you bring up an issue that Julie and I are studying carefully, which is uh, as a part of our zero tax increase on the uh, referendum, we're actually um, reducing the debt service fund balance, not the general fund, but the debt service fund balance. And we're going to have to be um, eyes on the ball to make sure if we do need to externally cash borrow because our debt service balance has dropped such that we don't have enough money to loan to our general fund, we need to be prepared to go externally to borrow funds. Mm -hmm. and, but yes, uh, uh, it will affect cash flow. Anytime you deficit, it would uh, affect the cash flow. In, in dipping below the 20% <coughs> reserves, which is below kind of the board guidelines right. that we set, would we anticipate any impact on our bond rating as a result of that pretty significant reduction in our fund balance and drop below our, that may have some other unforeseen cost impacts down the road because of that? First of all, you're describing that we actually are planning a deficit in the amount that's shown on this first draft of a proposed budget. And um, we need to make sure that between now and the next board meeting, we sift out and make sure what that number really looks like. But uh, in theory, yes. So that, because that is significantly different higher than I think the last budget that was presented and but is also, that on just not because I think at that time you still said that there are variances like health insurance was dependent on what our staff chose and you know it was figured at a certain amount of so many families so many individual but the reality is it may come out different but I think that was still in there and it seems that and I know we've added staff but certainly not to that one point whatever million dollar level right so so just I, yeah like I started I just want you to know that there's a lot of work yet to be done in the individual line items that make up the summary um, I was going to just follow up on what Jay said it could affect the bond rating but a 19 percent plus fund balance is still a very healthy fund balance um, we certainly will strive to drill down into these numbers and make sure that we are within the range that the board has set for the approved fund balance. In fact, what you see on the screen is from last year's annual report. Annually, we report out where we are in the target range, and you can see at 22.7 and 22.3 percent, we're hugging that upper limit of the um, mm -hmm. fund balance target zone, um, which puts us in a, a good position, but uh, it was a healthy position, and we want to retain that healthy position between those two target zones that the board's established. Yep. Other questions, comments? Lisa, you look like you wanted to well, I was just part of that discussion today in the Finance Committee, and I kind of felt like, um, you know, with the further explanation or exploration into the, the health insurance and the savings there and the enrollment, you know, potential revenue from that, it seemed like it would be possible to stay, you know, within that range of that 20% or less. And I didn't, I mean, it didn't seem like that was going to be difficult to do. And I did speak to that at finance. Um, you know, we are look, seeing enrollment that is greater than anticipated. And the revenue in this proposed is based on enrollment projection, which is historical. And sometimes that can change. You know, you don't always know what's going on until, well, last week or two weeks ago. And, you know families coming in so some of those increased enrollment numbers would obviously impact the revenue side of this proposed budget decreasing any deficit spending so. can I ask a question just as far as a proposed budget it is not uncommon to get numbers that have a good chance of changing a good amount between now and the next two weeks I mean Jay in your experience have you seen this where you've seen something that just is kind of coming out looking like this because it could be kind of concerning you know from board members that are looking at the numbers but then you go back and you do see your changes and you figure out where this is coming from 
Yeah, we're committed to meet the timelines that the board has. Um, not presenting something tonight was just the zero option because we're not going to get to the next meeting and present it for the first time and ask you to take action on it. So um, even though it's not a final set of numbers, uh, we're bound and determined to bring something here tonight because the annual meeting date isn't going to change. Mm -hmm. And you need to present a proposed budget on that date. And we just finished the audit. And but, but one of the adjustment factors you do on a budget is once you have finalized actual figures, it gives you a new benchmark for moving forward on your projections for the following year. And that, we just met with the auditor to receive the preliminary report tonight. So this just indicates some of the, um, we're not done baking this uh, pie up. We, we need to do more work to make sure it's coming out with something you'll be comfortable with presenting to the public and we're confident with in terms of the numbers. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right, thank you very much. I would say I appreciate Mr. Menninger's uh, thorough eye. That's in fact the same thing that the Finance Committee <laughs> talked about in depth uh, at its meeting earlier. You're bringing this to the meeting today? <laughs> That's what I said. It's Being an, an old Tim. Finance Committee member. Yep. There you, go. <laughs> you know what we're looking for. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Then um, Educational Assistant Academy on the Prairie, Julie Krakow. I think you also have the Sand Lake Elementary one, so you might as well just do them together. I think I'm presenting out of order <laughs> coming after that. Um, so I am here again to talk about two additional educational assistant positions. Um, one is at the Academy on the Prairie. Um, I think if you recall back, um, during this past school year, I came and asked for a temporary position for the Academy on the Prairie to help out down there and we would like to make that a permanent position at this time. Um, we've kind of expanded our program at the Academy and one of our teachers spent some of her time doing some online courses up at the high school. When she does that, it leaves a gap down there at the Prairie. So we're looking for a person who can spend part of their day there and then come back to the high school for the afternoon and support um, a high need student that has moved into the district. So that's what that position is about. Um, the other position, if you recall my, uh, my information, last time that I was here, I talked about a self-contained program for a student who needed to come back to the district. Well, a day or two after I was here, um, we had a family who's, who had placed their own child out of district in a private placement, and they are returning too. So that particular student, in order for us to keep him here and put him in our new self-contained type program, he too will need um, an educational assistant and that's what this second um, position is all about. So I will take questions. And this, both of these are on the consent agenda this evening, so yes, questions. Not a, oh. I'm sorry, not a question tonight, but more of a comment and it's more of a, a just a, a, I think for the public to understand that these are the type of students that some of the private voucher schools don't have to take that we do and then have to figure out how to help facilitate their learning as well with these expenses so just when people think it's all equal it really isn't so very much so needed to say that would it be okay if I applaud <laughs> <laughs> and I was gonna okay. build on that too it's like all the dollars that this school district and other school districts put into these precious kids and Tom and I well many of yeah, there you are we've been out to the Academy we we've visited with our special ed teachers we know how much it costs to put up front that costs less after 20 years because those kids get successful and I'm so proud to approve something like this so Thank you, Tim, for what you just said. But yeah, um, that's kind of a little known fact, I think, sometimes with the public. Because it is expensive. It's very expensive. But until you have a child like that yourself, you don't value the worth. We just so. feel that this is the best place for them. Yes. <laughs> I would agree. I um, met, uh, I've worked with some teachers out there, and uh, actually, I saw one at 
quick trip um, right at the end of the school year, and I asked her how her year went, and she was sadly tell, telling me that uh, a lot of the kids don't are sad the school year is ending because it's the only structure they have. So even though it's kind of a barracks out there, I understand why you got it. So. <laughs> Okay, no other questions, then I guess we will move on to the consent agenda. We have 10 items this evening, and unless there is an item that you'd like to have withdrawn and considered separately, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. I would so move. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Um, items as presented, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Board member reports and discussion. I'll call on board members. Did you want to make a comment? I did want to just, oh. we have a resignation I just wanted to make note of. Please um, do. Yeah. Gaylord Herbert, also known as Herb, he was hired in 2001, back when the district was much smaller. And Herb began when Retirement. They, it's a retirement, yeah. Sorry, okay. he's retiring. <laughs> Sorry, I missed this step. I was so excited to talk about Herb. <laughs> and I want to thank Beth Hobbs for helping me out because being new, I didn't get to a chance to know Herb very well. But um, there was two stalls in the garage, um, and he was interviewed in the middle school portables, and now there's five stalls with beautiful transportation maintenance help. Herb brought his experience on working with truck engines to the school district and kept our kept the aging fleet on the road and has kept up with the ever-changing needs of our school buses in this computer generation. So we want to thank Herb for all of his dedication, service, and patience in the transportation department. I just wanted to make sure I got a chance to speak to that. Thank, thank you. you. Sorry. Thank you. And congratulations, Herb. <laughs> Okay, then more board member reports and discussion. I'll call on members um, if they have any committee reports yet that they would like to share. Um, and I will start with um, Tim. Um, no committee reports, but as, as I'm already on a roll tonight here, um, <laughs> thought, thought I, I might just share the fact that, you know, schools here start September 1st, as is uh, bound by state law, but there are a lot of schools in the area that start next week already that are not bound by that state law. I know some of the private schools already start August 26th, and if I recall correctly, that means our buses need to start running because we need to provide busing transportation for some of those as well. So not only do we not have to coordinate our start dates, but we have to incur some expense because of that as well. So just once again remind the public that that is another effect on the school district of Holman. And so. those can be voucher schools that we're transporting. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So. Okay. Mr. So Dunlap. That's all I have. Thank you, Tim. Mr. Dunlap. I'd like to welcome everybody back to school and uh, hope they have a good year. <clears throat> and as usual, uh, a lot of activity around the school, the school buildings, and I want everybody to be as safe as they can be. Okay, thank you. Um, Tom Cruise. Yes, um, had a, I went to the home, high school freshman orientation. It was uh, a lot of energy. Um, it, was a, it was an enjoyable event, that, and I do agree that the school has uh, got a lot of, a lot of, a lot of kids there because the, <laughs> the bleachers are just packed. So it was kind of nice to see, uh, see that, and they had the the blue shirt crew there cheering them as they walk oh, through the door. I see nice. one. Oh. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Well, thank you for doing that. I know that Lori was looking for help. And yeah, it was fun. It was fun. It, uh, she got me in right away so because she knew I had to get over here. So. Okay. Well, then one of the blue shirt crew, Jeff Young, do you have anything <laughs> oh. you'd like to share? Um, yeah, so freshman orientation was tonight. So that was interesting. It was always fun to get them fired up about school, even though some of them are like, oh, what is this? <laughs> but yeah, it's always fun. And then I want to thank the Esplins personally for donating to the Holman Soccer Program. And we have our first game tomorrow at um, home. So I think it's at 6. Yeah, no. By 30, because my son wants me to take him. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we'll starts at 530, yeah. and but she said there's a lot of people going to be there and we're all hyped up about it so that'll be really fun to watch and all the other sports i begin are starting like football started last friday and like so just support all the random stuff that's going around school district so yeah. thank you jeff um anita jagosinski 
Um, I would just like to say welcome to all our new staff, um, the ones in the audience who I'm trying to remember. Is it Greg? Craig? Yeah, Greg. Welcome to Holman. We're glad to have you. And um, welcome back to all the staff and um, students this year. And just since Tim kind of primed the pump a little bit, I would just like to say <coughs> to all the parents out there and community members, please remember to thank people who work in public education and support your public schools. They're doing the best they can and they are working more and more with less and less every year, especially this year. So thank them. Look them in the eye and, and thank the teachers and the secretaries and the bus drivers and the, I know I'm gonna forget somebody and the nurses, everybody. Tell them thank you, because that means a lot. So principals too, sorry about that. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, be supportive of those public schools because you want them to be around for many, many decades. And unless you support them, they will not be. So that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Kate Mayer. Um, I've got a list, so I'll fill in what you forgot there, Anita, <laughs> because I'm thinking the same thing. There's always people we want to thank. Um, it's a new year. We all drive by the parking lots. We see cars more and more every day teachers um, the whole staff that goes there before they have to get paid for it they even go there and we thank you for all that um, thank you to the health people the grounds people transportation custodial IT food service the paras the secretaries the teachers um, administrators and in all of those categories to all the I was going to say old, but that sounds, I'll say returning, to the returning and to the new folk of that.